Good morning. Our opening words today are by Ken Ogunas from the book Walden on Wheels. I'd once heard that we are nothing but our stories. Forget the blood, bones, genes, and cells. That's not what we are. We are rather our stories. We are an accumulation of experiences that we have fashioned into our own grand sweeping narrative. We are the events and people and places to which we've assigned symbolic meaning. And it's when we step outside our stories that we feel most lost. If we take the wrong path at the classic fork in the road and fail to act in a literary sort of way, our story falls apart. Words run off the page. Paragraphs are cluttered with red markups. Pages fall out of the binding, and we lose a grip on our identity. My name is Deb Gang, and I will be your service leader today. Now I just want to welcome you with live from Fellowship Hall. It's our LCUUF Sunday service. Our announcements are on a slideshow before the service. If you didn't see them, don't worry. They'll be sent by email in the next day or so. A few notes, though. Our building is now open to all participants. We will continue to offer our service on Zoom even as we welcome people into the fellowship hall. We ask people here to continue to wear masks in the building to better protect those of us who are immunocompromised or not fully vaccinated. And now a, spe a special welcome to our visitors. If you are visiting with us for the first time or have returned or reconnected with us after a long absence, we invite you to say your name and tell us where you're from. If you're on Zoom, use the Zoom raise hand feature, or just turn your video on and wave your hand, and we'll ask you to unmute. If you're in the room, just raise your hand. I know, I'm coming, I'm coming. Hi, I'm Kim Kovac. I moved here in January from Phoenix, and I've been a Unitarian since I was three years old, and I'm um, looking forward to making new friends and joining the, this UU community. Welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Do we have anyone on Zoom? All right. Our chalice lighting words today are offered by Reverend Florence Caplo. We kindle this flame honoring the doorways in our souls, the windows through which we gaze at one another, the balconies where we catch glimpses of sky, the thresholds we stand on on this morning, wandering, hoping, fearing, and dreaming. Please light your chalice. We kindle this light in celebration for the love Good morning. My name is Chris Gang. I'll be presenting later today. Um, but right now, we have our opening hymn, Spirit of Life. I think most people in the room have heard of it. It was originally written as a prayer. It was never meant to be a hymn, let alone the anthem for the denomination. Please join in singing or praying hymn number 321, Spirit of Life.
Each week, we take time to remind ourselves that we belong to a community which cares for each other. We do this by sharing any significant joys or sorrows in our lives. If you have a joy or sorrow to share today and you're on Zoom, you can type it into the chat now and we'll read those aloud. First, let's start with our sorrows or concerns, whatever you or the world may be holding that is in need of our caring and healing thoughts. You're welcome to type sorrows and concerns in the chat box. First, we'll start with the folks here to give you on Zoom time to type. Are there any sorrows or concerns that people would like to share here in the room? My name, my name is Sue Kelly. I would like to, to uh, voice my concern for all the people of Louisiana, especially New Orleans. As all of you know by now, one of our members, Howard, passed away a week ago today. Uh, for those of you who want to do a little more than just sharing your concern internally, um, Hannah is moving today, or partially today, to a house about two and a half blocks from the fellowship. Anybody who'd like to stop by and see if they can lend a hand, just see me after the service. Yes, um, another Howard, Howard Feldstein, friend of ours, passed yesterday in a hospital in, in Texas of COVID. Yeah, I have concern for the, both the Americans and those who we've left behind in Afghanistan that are having a hard time getting out. Are there any joys or sorrows on Zoom? Yes, we have a uh, sorrow from, uh, I'm just making sure my microphone is on, I'm sorry. We have uh, a sorrow expressing concern and sympathy for Hannah Frederick on the death last Sunday of her husband, Howard. Hannah is moving today into the house they just bought a week ago, and she needs our love and support. That is from Kathy Coaches. That's it. Oh, I see another one uh, here. Oh, this is a joy. Okay. Okay, we'll in a minute. Now let us recall the joys, whatever you may be celebrating, whatever evokes a feeling of joy or peace for yourself or others. You're welcome to type joys into the chat box. Again, we'll start with the folks here. Are there any joys that people would like to share? Okay, now is the time for the Zoom people to share their joys. Now, this is from Ron and Ann Gilbert. Ann and I had a great time visiting Cheryl Swain and her visitors, Lynn and Gary Cleek in Atlanta this past week. And they all will be coming to Gettysburg this coming week to visit with us. Very happy. And that's what we have from Zoom. Hey, thank you. And this candle from our care team represents those sorrows that are too raw, too difficult for us to share aloud. So many of us have had losses, partners, children, grandchildren, losses that remain present with us every day. So many of us have burdens, anger, fear, and frustration, all of those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. 
we will light this candle for all those unspoken sorrows. I got mugged on Christmas Eve and I went up to my apartment and immediately posted on our local parents list the street I had gotten mugged on and when it happened. And I got two emails back within the hour, not from people concerned about me asking, oh, are you okay after you got mugged? But complaining that I had posted the exact spot where the mugging had taken place because what I had done might adversely affect their property values. It was enough of a shock that it made me want to look at how had this happened to people? How had a neighborhood become more concerned with its property values than people's experience of one another and their own town? What I started to do was look at the different ways we as modern Americans have become disconnected from one another, disconnected from the places we live, disconnected from the value we create, and even disconnected from our own sense of self-worth. Good morning. In 2013, I found I was out of a job, on unemployment, and trying to figure out what my next career move would be. It was at this time that I read two books that altered the course of my life for the next six years until we moved here to Ahihik. Both books were referred to me by my adult children. The first was Walden on Wheels, which you heard the opening reading from, by Ken Elgunas, who told his story about graduating from college with a mountain of debt and an unmarketable degree, and how he stepped out of the preordained expectations for life and made his own way. A story I could relate to 30 years after the fact. The other was Life, Inc., by Douglas Rushkoff, who you just heard. The history of how corporations evolved from being convenient legal entities to encompassing all aspects of our life. These two books helped me look back on my life and see more clearly how and why I made the decisions I made about, the, about my career and jobs, not for the purpose of eating myself up, but because of what I could have or should have done, but now how to reimagine my future in such a way where I'm not making compromises as to work I do and how I ultimately retire. If you heard Reverend uh, Matt's sermon last week, then you may recognize that what happened to me after reading those books was that I had, perhaps for the first time in my life, a vision. It wasn't as clear as seeing my way to early retirement in life in Mexico, not yet. That would be vision part two. But it was that I needed to recalibrate our more consumer-oriented lifestyle, reduce our debt, and open myself to alternative work opportunities. But first, a little background on how I got that vision thing. The decision to go to college or not never entered my mind. By high school, I was locked into the college prep track. I, re I never really wanted to be a business major. I wanted to be a history teacher. However, school counselors, my parents, and some trusted close friends of my parents all believed that what would be best for me would be to get a degree in business. It was 1978, the end of the glory days of liberal arts degrees and apparently education degrees. Ironically, I was accepted at Bowling Green State University, a university most renowned for their education school. I'd wanted to go to the Ohio State but I wanted to continue in a marching band, and the OSU band was all brass, and I played saxophone. So Bowling Green it was. Quite a way to pick a school, eh? Not very sound business decision for a soon-to-be business major. Here's what Ken Algunas had to say about this. It all began in August 2001, when I decided to participate in one of the great annual migrations known to man. Alongside millions of fellow 18-year-old Americans, I had graduated from high school and was going to college. My high school class and I moved like a school of fish. We graduates were capable of going off on our own in whatever direction we chose, but something demanded we all swim as one, curving, cutting, sashaying together, wiggling our way to college. Except for a few miscreants, we all ended up in college. At some point, I'd convinced myself that going to college was what I really wanted to do. Yep, 
That was me, all right, to a T. Two years in, I realized I was in the wrong degree course, but also realized in order to change at that point, I would need an additional year of undergraduate school, and I was already more in debt than I really wanted to be. So I graduated after four years with a Bachelor of Sciences degree in business and a minor in statistics, and $10,000 in debt, which is a fraction of what my, both my children ended up with. During my last semester, I did make an effort to apply for a master's program in history, but was unsuccessful in getting accepted, let alone figuring out how to finance a master's degree. Again, here's Ken Elgunis. It wasn't just the exams or the debt that left me feeling battered and frayed and a little crazy. It was that I began to see that I lived in a free country, but couldn't say I knew what it really felt like to be free. And while I owned plenty of stuff, a car, DVDs, CDs, clothes. I never felt like I owned my own life. College had helped me see how everything for my whole life had either been predetermined or planned out. I went to college because I was supposed to, and now I'd enter career world because I was financially obligated to. Ken nailed it for me here. However, he did not enter the career world but went on to Alaska and got a job where food and lodging was provided and there was nothing to really spend money on. Several years of this and other similar jobs and he paid off his $27,000 in debt. I was not capable of seeing such a radical alternative 40 years ago, or maybe 50. Uh, so off to the corporate world it was for me. I decided to leverage my statistics background and look for work in corporate research. I went through the cattle call of university placement programs, focusing on big companies of Ohio like Owens Corning and Procter and Gamble, as well as larger known research companies like Nielsen. It was in 1982 and the actual number of recruiters showing up on campus were few and they had no place for a B student. So off into the world I went, who are those people? <laughs> so off into the world I, we went with Deb, who I met at Bowling Green and graduated with a and she graduated with a degree in political science and French. The two of us together barely made for one marketable individual, especially in 1982. We were less than desirable, according to Rushkoff, corporate citizens. For six months, I slogged between interviews while working for my soon-to-be father-in-law's construction company, uh, running a jackhammer and wheeling concrete. One helpful interviewer noticed that I had no real-world experience. Uh, well, duh, need to have a job to have experience. Bowling Green College of Business at that time had no internship programs. Uh, so, good luck, graduates. This interviewer kindly referred me to a marketing professor at a local small state university. I contacted him and asked if he had anything to, any marketing research projects I could help him with, for no pay, of course. Uh, he did not have any at the time, but might have something in the near future, so great, back to the jackhammer. Sometime around December 82, I got a call from a woman in a marketing research department of a division of a very large private corporation, Carlson Companies, I'm sure you recognize some of those names. She worked for the division that sold and supported sales incentive programs, a multi-million dollar industry that evolved out of the trading stamp industry. Many of you here may remember trading, trading stamps. Uh, actually, it was plaid stamps, this company, and gold stamps. She needed someone to replace a staffer who was going on maternity leave. My job would be to research what the, comp what the competition was doing. No statistics required, just the ability to talk a good research game, some chutzpah, and, well, lying. As an aside, the, the woman never contacted personnel about this position or her need. She just went to the same university press professor that I had been in contact with and asked him if he knew of someone. He gave her my name and they hired me directly. No personnel involved. To this day, I kind of laugh at the fact that I backdoored my way into the corporate career I never really wanted. <laughs> Again, who are those people? <laughs> Yahoo, I had a corporate marketing research job. My career had begun. Now Deb and I could get married, move out of her parents' place, and start to save for our first house. We never actually saved because I had college loans, we had to buy a car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were on the course that we, our family, and everyone else we knew at the time believed we should be on because that's the way it worked. So what was it about Rushkoff's book, Life Inc., that resonated so strongly with me? 
It was the way he described how Americans embrace the myth of rugged individualism, independence, self-reliance, and the notion that I am the decision maker and I alone can change my destiny. And then he deconstructs this myth by documenting how corporations went from being convenient legal fictions to being the dominant fact of contemporary life. Rushkoff presents the history of corporations going back to the Renaissance, the role the world monetary system and centralized banking played in reinforcing and strengthening the power, scope, and wealth of corporations at the expense of individuals and society in general. The book is expansive in its coverage of all these aspects of the corporatization of society. However, what really hit home to me and what I think would be most relatable were the parts where he discussed real estate and the disconnect from home. Consumer empowerment and the disconnect from choice and public relations and the disconnect from one another. Following the prescribed pattern, Deb and I bought our first home when we were 24. A few years later, we moved to Minnesota, with Carlson Companies, of course, rented a year and bought, about, bought our, house, our second house when we were both 28, a small, 800-square-foot bungalow near the city center. That's the house. Into the tone of real estate value, that house was torn down about 10 years ago, and a two-story house was built on that lot because the value of land in that neighborhood had gotten so great. We lived in that house for nine years until we had a second child. Though we lived in an urban neighborhood we loved, we convinced ourselves we needed a bigger house for the boys. We moved to the suburbs of Minneapolis, where we bought our third house, a spacious and characterless two-story. That house. We were never even able to afford furniture for the living room for that house, so the boys had plenty of space. No, we never did. A necessary job change and a move back to Dayton led to our fourth and biggest house, a 3,600 square foot monster located in one of the more affluent suburbs of Dayton, Ohio. My parents, who still live in the small house I grew up in to this day, when they visited, my dad said he needed a beeper because he was afraid he'd get lost. <laughs> that house. <laughs> this beautiful house. This was the point in my career when I thought I'd made it. To go with the house, I bought a zippy little Mitsubishi Eclipse, and we bought a Ford Expedition. To this day, I don't know why we bought the Expedition. Um, I was somewhat living in a fantasy world. We had a monster mortgage to go with this house, two car payments, and the pressure to continue earning the salaries to maintain the lifestyle we thought we wanted and had achieved. Deb and I had followed the very well-worn real estate path where bigger is better and maximizing home equity is the goal. Until, of course, it isn't. The veil was finally lifted for me after reading Life, Inc. Here's Rushkoff on the creation of the suburbs, real estate, and disconnect from home. By the 20th century, the kind of money that could be made developing a single successful suburb was well known to both railroad barons and real estate speculators. Transit tycoons shifted their emphasis from providing good transportation for people to manipulating the value of undeveloped farmland. They built rail lines to the subdivisions they owned while passing over those of their competitors. They never even intended for the rail services to be profitable. Tracks were a loss leader for the real estate sales they enabled. Neighborhoods and commuter lines were not natural phenomena that sprang up around the needs and activities of people. They were master plan developments aimed at delivering land speculation profit. The automobile might have changed all this, but it actually served to accelerate the conversion of place to property. And Rush ca captured the most pronounced impact of the transition that followed the mass migration to the suburbs, which was the loss of community, neighbors helping neighbors, watching out for each other's children, to the concept of home as the bastion of me and what I, what I have become and how it stacks up to my neighbors. Front porches and neighbors socializing with neighbors replaced by private backyards in isolation, speculating whether you stack up to the lifestyles of the neighbors you rarely interact with and barely know. Again, here's Rushkoff describing this transformation from a personal standpoint. He says, when I was a child, we lived in a middle-class urban neighborhood, a working man's section of Queens, New York. It wasn't fancy or even particularly quaint. But I do remember, surely romantically and inaccurately, how the tiny yards of my semi-detached homes were all connected to create one great big one. 
Every Friday evening, someone would light the big barbecue grill at the end of our dead-end block and launch a weekend-long cookout. I don't know who, if anyone, that grill belonged to, but pretty much any kid could show up with a hot dog or a drumstick, drumstick and one of the grown-ups would make sure it was cooked right. As my father moved up the career ladder, we moved out to the suburbs. Bigger houses, better schools, brighter prospects. But all that stood out to my seven-year-old sensibilities was that in our new neighborhood, each family had its own barbecue grill in the backyard, and that each backyard was separated from the others by a fence or high hedge. The houses weren't even attached. Families would compete via patio landscaping, grill size, or cuts of meat. The Millers ate porterhouse, while the Portnoys grilled nothing but filet mignon. Now, instead of barbecuing with the Joneses, we were barbecuing against them, or at least apart from them in a typically suburban status war. The fun was gone from the barbecue, even though market metrics would have registered a huge increase in grill popularity. By the time I was a teenager, we didn't grill at all anymore. We had more money, more land, and more stuff, but we seemed to be experiencing less of what made our poorer neighborhood more, well, fun. My family was just one of many making the exodus from the city to the suburbs over those decades. Getting out of the city was a sign of having made it. To my parents, it surely felt as though they had finally earned the right to make an independent, conscious decision of where and how to live. Of course, they'd merely succumbed to the agenda of a more contemporary breed of speculators who saw in the creation of the suburbs a path toward turning what had been worthless land into an investment opportunity. Their efforts might not have succeeded, however, were they not so well matched with the twin requirements in the new industrial base. Manufacturers required a class of consumers anxious to buy all the goods, especially automobiles, that factories were churning out. But they also needed a class of workers satisfied with the bounty their labors could earn them. The new suburbanites would be both. The first house we, we, we bought there was um, that type of neighborhood that we abandoned for the suburbs. And regret to this day, I think. But just making it to the suburbs was not enough. Scores of other corporations learned to support, sorry, scores of other corporations learned to support and exploit the suburban propensity for ownership and self-sufficiency. In 1935, General Electric sponsored architectural competitions for model homes that used as many GE appliances as possible. One architect incorporated 76 of them. Over the next two decades, women's magazines such as Ladies Home Journal glamorized the latest household products as well as the push-button control over life that they offered. Life in the suburbs became about buying things, installing appliances, and making improvements. The very premise for the suburbs was to turn more of the real world into a market opportunity. So it shouldn't be surprising that it provided such a terrific canvas for successive layers of marketeering. Just moving to the suburbs made people more dependent on products and less able to share. And this brings me to Rushkoff's focus on the role of corporations and their impact on consumer empowerment and the disconnect from choice and public relations and the disconnect from one another. With regard to the incorporation of owning real estate, living in the suburbs was an investment. We closely followed that prescribed playbook. However, and maybe because I was in a marketing career and had insight into corporate marketing goals and strategies, we fell less a victim to corporate-driven consumerism and to the concept of cult branding that has been so successful since the early 2000s. Here's Rushkoff's take on this, specifically corporate branding. He writes, advertising strategist and author Douglas Atkin developed the science of cult branding around this basic insight. It's Atkins' belief that there's nothing inherently wrong with corporations providing people with the systems they use to make meaning and forge identities in the modern world. While in another era, a person might have used the Catholic Church as saints as the collection of symbols through which to assemble a meaning system, today, a person uses an array of icons or brands 
developed by corporations. What's inherently worse in this? As Atkin writes, the evidence of my and others' research is that whether we like it or not, brands are being used as credible sources of community and meaning. And Rushkoff thinks there's an important reason why they have been elevated to this role. According to Atkin, corporations have simply stepped in where traditional meaning makers have failed us. If churches and civic organizations have become incapable of providing people with meaning, why shouldn't corporations provide this necessary human need? What this analysis leaves out is that the failure of churches and civic organizations was not an entirely unaided phenomenon. Corporations, sometimes as a part of misguided government strategizing, intentionally undermine the foundations of community organi organizations in their effort to promote self-interested consumerism. Atkin conducted dozens of focus groups with the members of real and consumer cults, from Scientology members to Harley-Davidson riders, and found them yearning for the exact same things. To belong and to make meaning by investing in a brand with the qualities that make cults so compelling, Atkin helped the corporations who hired him build deep connections with consumers. Whether a laptop or a pair of running shoes can actually come close to fulfilling either of these fundamental needs depends just on how disconnected we are from the possibility of their genuine fulfillment in the first place. The more desocialized we are, the more dependent on Atkin's external prefab meaning systems we become. The brand transcends and in some cases replaces time and space. A Disneyland souvenir used to have some connection to a trip to Disneyland. As commercial as it may have seemed back in the 60s, its souvenir shops welcomed tourists as they arrived and gave kids a final chance to bring some of Disneyland home with them when they left. Today, a Mickey Mouse doll or ears or framed animation image is available at a Disney store at the local mall. Does a Mickey Mouse hat bought at the mall store have any less connection to Mickey or the Magic Kingdom than one bought in the shop on Disneyland's Main Street USA? Both are manufactured in the same factory in China under conditions no one really wants to know about. But the hat itself is no longer the souvenir of a place or a trip, but of a more abstract brand. It's an imitation of a souvenir a souvenir once removed. The brand has replaced what we might call its aura. Last Sunday, Reverend Matt referred to the concept of influencers, used by savvy marketers to create visions for us, the consumers, to aspire to and ultimately consume. Here's Rushkoff's description from a, decade, from a decade ago, mind you, about the impact of influencers and what he, what he considers the incorporation of the individual and the destruction of social reality. With the advent of TikTok, Pinterest, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, the impact of this corporate influencer infiltration is even more profound today, a decade since this was written. A study by PQ Media, which collects econometric data and researches alternative media, estimates that companies paid outside agencies $1.4 billion for word of mouth marketing now referred to as influencers, in 2007, up from less than 100 million in 2001. This activity isn't limited to fringe products. It has become a mainstay for the most traditional corporations and boring products as well. Procter & Gamble's own word of mouth marketing armies have swelled to some 600,000 adult consumer marketers. That was 10 years ago. And over 200,000 teens. While kids push popular products to their friends online and off, their moms talk up their favorite products at work or at social gatherings and events. An adult campaign codenamed Vocal Point targeted women with larger than average social networks. These popular moms spoke to an average of 25 to 30 other women a day compared to the normal mom who spoke with just five. Hmm. Regions where the Vocal Point campaign 
was used sold on average 17% more product than those relying on traditional advertising. P&G considered this marketing ethical, meaning as long as you never find out your friends are really marketers, what does it matter? Practitioners now like to call this exploitation of community and friendship social marketing. They don't see it as the destruction of social reality, but as its very rehabilitation. Sufficiently disconnected from the remains of a shared human culture, the amateur marketers believe they are creating opportunities for people to engage with one another again. The products they're pitching are just the excuse to start up a good conversation on a landscape where this exaltation of the self is dependent on gaining a competitive advantage over one's friends, how better to gain a leg up than to transcend the role of worker or consumer and become a living part of a corporation's brand image. May as well be considered a form of corporate enabled self-improvement. I actually had the opportunity to attend an all day seminar in Cincinnati where the strategy of this was played out and discussed and how it worked. And ugh. <laughs> as suburban dwellers most of our lives, did we fit into this model of incorporated consumption? On the consumer as corporate advocate, we were more skeptical and reticent. We were not the voracious consumers that corporations sought, always needing more of the next best thing. Hell, we could not even afford furniture for that suburban, first suburban home. We were too incorporated in a large mortgage. We focused more on our limited discretionary spending at thrift stores, local vendors, and artisans and charities. The suit came from a thrift store. <laughs> Yes, we felt the pressure of corporate consumerism and occasionally fell victim to it through some of our automobile purchases and occasional extrav extravagances for the boys. But compared to our contemporaries, we were consumer Luddites. Heck, I still don't even have an Amazon account. So what happened to my corporate career? I stayed in the niche incentive industry for 30 years, eventually working for smaller companies, performing some of the same services with more autonomy and control. The industry also involved two more consulting and training work, which I got involved in in my later years. So I finally did get to do some teaching. So was I happy with my chosen career? Well, as they say here, mas y menos. At times it was challenging and rewarding, and at other times it broke me down. However, it worked for our family, and I had yet to see an alternative course. I was never that guy who always stayed until seven or eight o'clock, or came in on Saturdays in order to climb the next rung. Those times were family times, and I do not regret lost promotions or less than stellar reviews. I guess I was never passionate enough about my work to sacrifice what I valued more, family, friends, and my community. Actually, when I worked at Carlson Companies, it was clearly stated that you work Monday through Friday to your, do your job and Saturday to get ahead. Life Inc. helped me understand why I felt like an imposter much of my adult life. It was never that I bought into one, the corporate career game, and two, the complementary consumerism that I was supposed to enjoy while having a successful career. I realized that I had not been totally incorporated. I was more like a subsidiary. I would like to think it was my UU upbringing that kept me somewhat grounded. Who knows? So, out of work in 2013, inspired by Wild Nine Wheels and Life Incorporated, and both of us realizing something had to change, we developed a plan. Deb and I would sell our large suburban home, move to a historic inner city neighborhood that we'd already fallen in love with, much to the chagrin of our family and friends who thought we were crazy, giving up such a beautiful home, and worst of all, risking our 17 years of accumulated equity. The horror. We would live in the new home in a historic neighborhood until we retired at age 65. I'm 61, by the way. <laughs> Uh, or so. Rent the house and move to an exotic lower cost of living location like Costa Rica, Ecuador, Panama, or I don't know, Mexico. I still, need to, I still needed to pay the bills, so through my political connections I was able to secure a job as assistant treasurer through my friend and political colleague, the county treasurer. This job paid less than my career jobs, but it was more in line with our new vision and new lifestyle. We were home, we were home in our new historic craftsman dwelling. It was not an investment. It was who we really were. 
It had the best front porch where we spent most of our time relaxing, greeting and conversing with neighbors and friends and relishing being part of the urban community once again. Uh, I used to joke the first year we were there that we bought a porch with a house attached. It was truly a neighborhood in the classic sense. We looked out after each other and each other's children, had frequent, well, we didn't have children at the time, had frequent porch and patio social gatherings attended by all neighbors. Uh, it was an invigorating reconnection with people after years living in the self-isolating suburbs. We loved and embraced every minute of living there. Life had different plans, however, and fortunately, our vision, too, was able to adapt. I was good at politics, organizing, volunteer coordination, etc. I was too good. So I was part of a successful team that got my boss elected to a higher county office. And as a result, her appointed replacement replaced me. And in, and in addition, Debbie had quit her job one month prior. So, vision part two, retire somewhere other than the US. Our financial advisor said that we were living in a place, if we were living in a place like Mexico, we could afford to retire now, six years ahead of our plan. So we did. As part of our plan from 2013, we'd researched many expat communities in many countries. At the end of the day, Ahihik met our criteria because of the lake, proximity to a major airport and city, our ability to drive there, climate, cost of living, active hiking community, and everything else we know about. Ironically, I had no idea there was even a UU church here. Icing on the tropical cake. Events of 2013 set us on a course that steered us away from the corporate-controlled world, a course we followed into retirement. We no longer own a home, we rent, we have no debt, and we basically consume what we need. Truly life unincorporated. We have found a place where we are happier and more comfortable than we have ever been. We have new UU fellowship and have more friends than we have ever had in our lives. Friends we hike with, I hike with, lunch with, dine with, dance with, spiritualize with, and travel with in just two years. Wild Nun Wheels and Life Inc. came into our life at a very opportune time. They helped us discover that there were paradigms we had been stuck in, choices that we didn't know existed or were even possible, but in hindsight seemed so obvious. We were able to reimagine a different future and step out of those paradigms that no longer were working for us. So here we are on the shores of beautiful Lake Chapala. I hope and suspect that elements of what I say today will resonate and sound familiar for some of you. It seems like most people I have met since moving here have had their aha moment at some point in life. That someone, some book, or some event that opened eyes and presented opportunities to step out of a paradigm and chart a new course. The opportunity, as Ken Elgin has said, to step back into our stories and once again find our identity. Thank you. This is the time in our service when we ask that you remember that we share our gifts here through pledging and donations. Instructions for payments to the fellowship are on a slide during the announcements before the service every week. And while you are considering your gifts to the fellowship, remember that each month LCUUF donates 5,000 pesos or more to an organization providing food aid in our lakeside community. For the month of August, we've been supporting Poco a Poco San Pedro Itzikan. When you pay your pledge, please add something to share the basket as you use to place pesos in our physical basket. You can donate in the same way that you pay your pledge, but please donate share the basket separately or indicate what part of your donation is for share the basket. Your offerings are now gratefully received. Let us extinguish our chalices with these words, which we read together. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts and share with all the world.
Our closing words, as we open the service today with words by Ken Elgunis from Walden on Wheels, so shall we close. Words that so accurately sum up my story and the story of my journey to this time and this place. This is Ken. I was nervous about turning a new page and starting a new chapter, but I knew both by faith and experience that I'd be okay if I lived simply and kept a light load. I knew I'd be okay if I forever thought of myself as a student, whether seated within the walls of a classroom or on foot through the university of the great outdoors. And most of all, I knew I'd be okay if I listened to the oft unheard voice within, that wild man who whispers into your ear when you most need it and least expect it. Go for it. May it be so.